Hello. Hello, Helen. Hello there, Hello. you all right? <laughs> nice to meet you. Thank you for, for joining me on the BTS Creative Academy podcast. Uh, we're currently streaming live across YouTube, Facebook and Instagram. Um, we're here today to have a discussion with Helen Sunny, uh, who is the producer and production to be honest very gray so that's where I am right now <laughs> Good. And before we get into your show and all the details of what you're going to be doing up in Edinburgh I was looking at some of your Instagram and you mentioned about you've got a broken leg or you've, you've been in trouble recently yeah so basically I wish it was a broke just a broken leg because that's a lot more simple basically on the 1st of June whole stories start I um I just slipped in like a tiny bit of water in this. I was at a hotel. I was helping my dad at a convention that he was um, running at the NEC. And I just slipped on a bit of water and ruptured all four of my ligaments in my right knee, dislocated my knee. Uh, it went in two different directions or whatever. So I had to go to hospital and I've had a surgery. I need another surgery in two weeks. I think I can put weight on it. But hence why I'm in Birmingham uh, <laughs> right now, because this is where it happened. So, so it's it's made you, you're stuck there because of this injury on on basically. a on a altar. <laughs> it's basically, I mean, yeah. So my my parents live here. So, I mean, thank God if this had happened and I was just in a random city. I don't know what I'd have done. Just probably still be in hospital. But I've been working up the crutches, you know, uh, which I was useless at at first, but um. I'm aiming to go back to Sheffield on Tuesday. Sheffield's where Blackbright, like the theatre company, is based and where I live normally. But I haven't been there in seven weeks. So be nice to go home when I can soon, hopefully. Your parents are looking after you at the moment, though. They're making me lots of really nice food. Yep. Yeah, and uh... <laughs> it's, that's what we like to hear. <laughs> yes. They had to bring a bed downstairs because I can only like just about do some stairs now. So they brought my brother's childhood bed downstairs. I don't know how they managed it, but well done them. <laughs> when this happened, I guess you, there must have been some fear with the show coming up. Like Edinburgh, the Edinburgh Fringe Festival is what, six weeks away now? It's is four weeks right? away. It's four weeks. Four weeks. I'm not okay. Four weeks. Yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. So th there must have been fear. Yeah. You heard that. Yeah. I mean, that was one of the the first things that I kind of when I sort of realized what had happened because at first you're just kind of in shock and then I was just kind of in the need to scream for some help or whatever stage and then when I was actually in the ambulance and going to hospital and stuff I I said to my 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 boyfriend James who was like with me not when I did it he he wasn't in the room so he <laughs> he came back to see me crumpled on the floor but um he was in the ambulance with me and I was like to him what if I can't do fringe like and that might sound silly like to some people but it's it's such a big this is something that we've been working on for so long um and put so much effort into and it feels like we're we're like we're finally getting some stuff kind of back from all of the effort that we're putting in so yeah horrible like terrifying couldn't go to Glastonbury gutted but you know that would be very that was a very fun thing something I, I wanted to do but fringe is like my thing if you know what I mean okay so tell me tell me about why why fringe is different than say going to Glastonbury for you why is that why is it okay that that Glastonbury got put on hold and well, fringe can't get put on like you're clearly sad that it you know it <laughs> yeah been and it would have been fun but but an Edinburgh sounds like it would be fun but why is it different different because I have um sort of you know personal stake in the stuff with the fringe so I'm a theatre producer um and 
for Black Bright Theatre Company, um, which is completely an independent, female, queer, neurodivergent-led company. We're very small, completely built from just myself and my other co-founder, Maddie, uh, Maddie Farnhill, who is also our writer. Us two working really hard over three years at this point. Four? Almost four, I think, because we actually started talking about doing stuff in, in 2020. Um, but uh, it's what I, you know, I have like, you know, jobs as well to actually earn a living and do all of that stuff. But at the moment, this is kind of what we're, we're really working towards um, and making, creating this sort of theatre that matters in general, we, we think are very important topics that we cover, but also it's something that I just enjoy so much. And the idea of not being able to do it would have been absolutely heartbreaking. The amount of conversations I had with the team of like, ah, <laughs> what are we gonna do? So I think everybody was a bit like, okay, it'll be fine, but it wouldn't really have been fine if like, cause I'm running the tech one, we're up there as well and just various things. It's a big job Edinburgh for anyone going. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and whereas, you know, I wasn't gonna be performing on the main stage of Glastonbury or something like that, you know? So that's the difference. You're not, you're not performing in this production, are you? You're the, the producer and the, the company manager, is that right? Yes, uh, that's right. So um, I, yeah, producer and company manager. So I won't be on the stage. I will be behind the tech box though. I'll be pressing the buttons. Um, I haven't designed the tech. We have um, an amazing designer, uh, Yanni, who um, one of the people that I met while at Sheffield Theatres. I'm a part of the development scheme program there called the Bank Cohort. Our director, uh, Chantelle Walker, uh, and also Yanni are also part of the Bank Cohort, as is Maddie. So quite a few of us come together through this. Um, but she did the design for the lighting and sound, but she isn't going to be with us for the whole of the fringe itself. Um, it costs quite a lot to hire a technician. So that's where I come in. You don't have to hire me. I'm here. Um, so, yeah. And uh, I did originally do mostly acting stuff, actually, before I, I trained at Birmingham School of Acting for a year. And I always kind of thought I'd go down that route. But I think the thing that a lot of producers say is I just kind of fell into it and then realized I was good at it and really liked it and I'm still doing it. I don't, mm. It's very, no one seems to have a very straight path to end up producing. No, no. So yeah. No, I, I, I've also fell into that myself, I, I think. I, I started doing it as an actor because I wanted to, to, dis, to discover more about what goes on in the theatre and understand it from other perspectives other than just being on the stage yeah um and then it's kind of built from there and it's it's where there can be a you know in any creative field it's hard to find a sustainable career financially mm. but being a producer can give you a few more options can't it yeah I, supp I suppose so in that way of, I think that was one of the things that I started to consider I basically the way that I fell into producing at the first point was um, I after I was at Birmingham School of Acting um, for I did a year course there and then I was trying to get into um, BA courses at drama schools uh, kept getting on waiting lists kind of got to the point of just being like I need to go somewhere so I went to Sheffield University to actually study philosophy and religion so but um, I, I went there because they have such a good theatre scene as well and then philosophy and religion very interesting a lot of people who do theatre do have done something like that along well, the it, way it, you know it it fits really doesn't it It does yeah the yeah two, it's all the two, kind of, the two come together quite quite nicely actually I think so yeah because it's it's all these sort of just you know these ideas and stories and what why do people feel and think certain things or act certain ways and it is just all very connected which is why I sort of ended up doing that um going to Sheffield uh I joined Sutco, Sheffield University Theatre Company, um, the society there. And at the end of my first year, going into second year, they were wanting a producer for this project called the 24 Hour Musical that they do by uh, annually. Not sure if that's still how they do it. I think it probably is, um, where it's like 
you have 24 hours to, to put on a musical, have all the performances and everything done. But eight months prior to that, there is a production team who's actually getting everything sorted and has to get the venue booked and sort out there being security on the site for the 24 hours that you're rehearsing in this space and food and scheduling and money and fundraising and all of that stuff. So I applied for that because I can't really sing or dance, uh, especially not now with my leg. So I, um, uh, I applied for that and I got it. And then I just got completely obsessed with it. <laughs> um, it's just, it's really interesting having, I see the producer as somebody who is one of the first in a lot, in my sort of understanding of it, it's different because it's such a wide varied role, but the producer is often one of the first people involved in a project and the last person to be involved in it as well. Um, they just have to know everything inside out. Um, I mean, you know, sometimes you do have producers that are more based on just getting money for shows and that's great. Like if that's um, the way that they want to do it, but I very much see myself as more a creative producer. It's the best way I can put it. <laughs> just as in, I like having some artistic kind of control and input in, even if I'm not actively on the stage. Mm -hmm. So mine and Maddie's first show we did with Black Bright was called The Hunger. We actually took that to Edinburgh Fringe last year. So this um, isn't your first time at the Edinburgh not at the Fringe. Fringe. No, it's no. our second. Um, but that was last year. Uh, and that was completely <laughs> insane um, because you just can't really prepare for a full month at the Fringe, no matter what you do, if you're just a kind of normal person and not like got loads of money and excess of time and not working three jobs at the same time. So it was crazy. But um it was great um and from that experience we uh we decided that we should go back if we could manage to sort it out such an expensive endeavor to do um but we're doing it so tell me tell me a little bit about the story i want to come back to your journey in a moment but for for anyone listening in and wants to know about what you're putting on at the fringe this year bird watching tell me a little bit about the story of what it's about bird watching yeah so bird watching is a folk horror play um it is about three girls who are friends from school poppy amelia and lauren they go on a camping trip in the northumberland forest it's basically the end of their school years so it's the kind of last hurrah before they go off to do whatever they're doing um and then as they're there they basically they find this bird's nest on the floor this is very early on, no spoilers, uh, find this bird's nest um, and they move it out of the way just because they don't want to damage it. But according to folklore, shouldn't move a bird's nest if you find it in the wild. It's one of those things. Um, and over the course of the show, they basically become paranoid that they think they're being watched by something in the trees, but they have different reactions to it. Um, but all three girls have their own sort of individual experiences and their own things that they've been masking as well in their lives so it's a bit of a, a is it psychological is it just in their kind of minds is it how they're reacting to their previous experiences is it actually like um supernatural elements uh, folklore in real real life um and it's exploration about the societal voyeurism of young women um and the female experience and the characters uh one of them is queer but closeted uh another one is neurodivergent but hasn't been diagnosed yet um and then the uh one of the other characters has had experience with um basically being followed uh, and and things like that in her life so they're all sort of elements of things that a lot of almost all female presenting people that I know have experienced in some level um, and bird watching is basically a look of all at all of that but at the same time it's spooky it's you know Blair Witchy kind of um, vibes to it uh, and it's going to be really really fun and we're very excited to get properly into rehearsal on the 15th we've already had a few days of uh, research and development period where we're sort of looking at the text and working with it but yeah it's basically 
a folk horror play with female queer and neurodivergent perspectives at the forefront, uh, a feminist piece, and yeah. <laughs> Who's this for? What what kind of audience is this going to appeal to? So there are obviously one of the things that we wanted to be sure of was even though the story has a lot of elements in uh, that our lived experiences are, um, we still wanted to make sure that we were reaching out and uh, appealing to people who fall into those de um, demographics. So queer m women, uh, people of neurodivergency, um, female presenting uh, people who have had experiences that they could relate to um, in the show also people who are fans of folk horror sometimes you know you just want to see a good spooky show um but we're coming at it with this underlying storyline as well which is something very important to what we all believe in um it's a 14 plus uh so that's uh you know if a 13 year old came and wanted to really see it um then we wouldn't not let them in but it's not for, it's it's not for a, young more children. A, more of a warning, more of a you would yeah. like to make sure the audience is aware that the, the subject matter is going to be quite adult. Yeah, and we've also got trigger warnings and stuff on as well because, like, of I just we just think that's important. Um, it doesn't ruin shows. It's a very important thing to have in. Um, if, you, if it's a good show, you've forgotten about them anyway by the time you're actually in it and immersed. So, um, But we want to make sure people can be aware of what they could potentially be going into um and it's it's not it's not all like you know super deep and dark it's it's quite funny as well there's these three 18 year old girls and sort of focuses a lot as well on female friendship around that age and it's a very kind of interesting time you know you don't really know who you are properly yet at that age and that kind of space between being at school or college and then going off to university or a gap year or moving abroad or something mm -hmm. is a very telling time and it's also kind of about the internalized misogyny a lot of women have as well so and how at that kind of age a lot of people can use that to kind of how they act or interact around others or make mm -hmm. others feel um so yeah, it, it's definitely a guidance, the uh, the 14 plus, but I think really people who'd be really interested in this, people who are interested in new writing, um, Maddie, so it's Madeline Farnhill, who's the writer, uh, the other half of Blackbriar Theatre. The other half of your, yeah, your team. Yes, very much, very much the other half of uh, Blackbriar, where um, we come as a package deal. Um, but she, yeah, so she's a really exciting uh, up and coming writer she's been getting loads of really cool opportunities she recently graduated from Bristol Old Vic on the drama writing MA there um, and she actually has another show that is going to be at the fringe as well this year that she's like written and given to another company that that she knows and we're friends with so that'll be really exciting to see but yeah people interested in new writing people who are interested in supporting work um, that represents the underrepresented in theatre uh, and also just general those sorts generally stories that are a bit different are a bit weird we like you know weird is a great word for us we, we think that's, that's you know weird is good um yeah weird is lovely weird is way <laughs> we should all slit in slide into weirdness sometimes that's what we'll exactly know. what you'll be doing if you see the yeah. show. Yeah. Nice. I like the sound of it. I'm I'm in, I'm intrigued and um I'm looking forward you know you you sound really excited by it which is a which is always a great great start. Yeah. And the <laughs> people working on the show are excited and infused by the by the story and the the message. Um I wanted to we touched on something briefly there that I'd like to go back to because I feel like this is quite an important topic at the moment is the, the trigger warnings that you mentioned. Now, with the trigger warnings, I find this quite interesting. I'm not, I haven't fully formed an opinion yet. So I'm, I'm interested to hear more about what you think on it. Mm -hmm. In film, we've had years of having age ratings 
on films and having guidance on on the DVD, what what you should be aware of of what you find within your entertainment. Mm -hmm. We've done that with film for the last 30, 40, 50 years. I, I'm not even sure how long. But it's, it's been, been a while. while. Whereas theatre, we're only just starting to, to bring this into theatre. There's no classification body, is there, with theatre. There's no, no one setting definitive rules, apart from equity may offer some guidance. Um, but it's up to you, isn't it, whether you put that 14 plus, whether you say to the audience, there is subject matters in here which may offend or may disturb. Yeah. Where do, where, so you're, put, you're choosing to put that guidance within. Why? So first and foremost, trigger warnings uh, and guidance is an accessibility feature. It's important, like, you know, for people who potentially may have had experiences in their lives that, um, you know, they would like to be aware of, you know, it, if um, they're going to walk into a show that, for example, discusses abuse, uh, if that's something that they've experienced in their own lives, it can be helpful for them just to know what they are, that the thing they are going to see will include that. And like you said, films and TV shows and video games and basically everything ever apart from theatre um, on the grand, on the wide scheme of things, like some have been doing it for a while, but they already mm. have it. Um, I think a big thing to point out in this as well is we are a neurodiverse led company as well. And that sort of, that comes into accessibility uh, in many ways as well that can help with trigger warnings. So um, if, you know, there are certain things that may affect you or even in the lighting or in how the tech is, it all is the same as like if it's in the subject matter as well. It's all things that people should be allowed to choose uh, if they want to go and see that. If you have epilepsy, you should be told if there's something with flashing lights. If you have PTSD, you should be informed if there's something going on in a show that might affect you you should just be able to know that going in and nobody should have to be shamed for knowing that because I mean if you get age ratings on music and guidance of strong language or anything like that it's really it's not a big ask for shows to do and I don't think that I don't think anyone's wrong for not including them it's something that until a few years ago I was quite new to I didn't really know about it and then it's something that I sort of became gradually more aware of like this is really important like why don't we have things like that and I think as well you know this show for example uh discusses you know things like that as such as um voyeurism young and uh, young women so you know potentially somebody who may have been stalked or somebody who um has been filmed without their knowledge uh, or had those experiences or um, somebody who's been attacked for being gay or anything like this or queer, they're all things that can affect you. And you should be able to know going into something if, like make your own informed decision. I think it's really just, it's, it's really quite unfortunate not to give people that choice because mm -hmm. you should have that choice. Um, you should be able to choose what you can go and see. And it doesn't mean you're never going to go see it. There are plenty of things that I might get affected by some days, but other days I'm like, oh no, I actually want I want to go see this or I want to, this means a lot to me, this topic. So I'll go and hear about it. I think some people have this idea that people who like trigger warnings or whatever are very like, oh no, I can't ever know anything that could affect me or upset me, no. It's not that, it's just respecting your audience, respecting yourselves as creatives as well, to know that it's important that all of you understand what's in the text. We had a whole session on well-being and talking through the topics in the show um, before we started our rehearsal, um, early rehearsal period. Uh, and something that I think is great to include here is the mention of, we are partnering with this amazing charity called Strutsafe, for the Edinburgh Fringe show. They're so cool. They're a volunteer-led UK-wide phone line um, that you can call if you're walking home alone at night. Um, completely volunteer-led, nobody's paid, um, and obviously 
they should be paid for their work but that's a whole another discussion and actually part of why we're helping to raise money for them we're going to the fringe and we'll be taking donations on their behalf um they have a whole page of resources and stuff around you know um mental health and trying to keep yourself aware of ways you can help yourself and help others and it all kind of comes together it's just you know there's no it's not a bad thing to be able to be aware of topics that are in shows or the same way that like i said a person with epilepsy should be able to know if there's flashing lights if it can affect you badly you should know it's really and we is, there a dan- is there a danger of disrupting the piece disrupting the the show that that you're putting on by spoilers by saying that that these subject matters are in, included that as an audience we don't get the opportunity to feel and discover no um i don't think so i think yeah obviously you can there are ways that you could do it that are like we're not asking for people to be like in scene three at the second line there's going to be um somebody's going to get shot in the face okay guys everybody aware it's not that no. but saying include scenes of violence or a gunshot sound because that's the sort of thing that can trigger off sensory overload in people as well <laughs> stuff like that um isn't gonna ruin it and it's not going to be spoilers i think that's something i actually when i first started thinking about this stuff i kind of had a thought of as well i was like well we don't really want to say this topics in it because it's a bit of a kind of oh wow moment but Mm. actually nobody (laughs) who who was involved in seeing that that previous show um (laughs) That we're, and, that we're doing about no, had any idea what it was no, so. i say in, in times where we've picked up a, a dvd and you look at the back of the cover to see what the film's about you don't not watch it because exactly. it has a warning. yeah you just and go in, if you don't because you choose not to because good. you're like then you did that and nobody cares that you didn't buy that dvd or download it yeah. on whatever yeah because you know? it's not so. it's not there are some forms of entertainment that aren't going to be for you based yeah, exactly. on the things that you want to consume yeah and that goes with all genres an informed choice that's what i think is the important thing yeah and um i think we're seeing a lot more plays and theaters and arts organizations in general really like actually using things like trigger warnings and if you're doing a good story then you're not gonna if you're if you're immersing your audience if you're doing if you have good acting if you have something interesting on stage People aren't going to be like, hang on, on the poster it said this, on the and the like smaller font down there, like it says on that DVD. You're going to be interested in the story, but you've made your informed decision before you buy your ticket. You know what you're doing, and it's your choice. And yeah, of course, some people can still get affected by things, but that that's life. A lot of people, you know, ha- unfortunately, like I mean, I I've definitely had experiences where I watched a show or something, and something's happened in it, and I've just been like, I need to leave, and that's okay as well. Like, it's it's something that i can be aware of and people can be aware of and i think not allowing your audience to have that is quite arrogant really being like no you will watch my art and you will have experience it exactly how i want you to sounds quite ego driven doesn't it (laughs) it is man it is like i Which is always a a fear for these creative people, having too much of an ego that that we force ourselves onto onto the audience. And I I think the ego is important to have for a creative. Definitely. It drives the art, but not in the sense of making people feel uncomfortable or people not not enjoying it because it's simply not for them. Yeah, You also mentioned about keeping your cast safe, keeping your cast aware and making sure they're in a good place with the show how, how does that work for you um so black bright in general we're a very collaborative body so basically ran by myself and uh, maddie but then we work with people on a project by project basis um so with this show bird watching we have um maddie's actually also acting in it but then we have um 
Mimi Milmore, an amazing Northern Irish actress, uh, and also Ellen Travaskis, who is London-based right now. Um, and we basically, at the beginning, right at the beginning of the audition process, we put on the kind of call-outs for expressions of interest from actors, the themes that are discussed in the show. And that, there we go, right at the forefront, is giving people the opportunity just to be aware of okay this thing that you're potentially wanting to audition for and be involved in discusses these topics they can choose to apply we were very lucky and got a really nice amount of auditions which is really exciting for us because we're we're two people basically until we become more for a project so you know um so we had it right from the beginning then um we uh, at the actual auditions would um say about you know like it's if there are certain bits that you're not comfortable with or whatever like you, you can talk to you can say you can let us know or you can just say oh like i'm not gonna do that this way right now i'm like cool no worries it's the auditions you're not going on stage in two seconds um there's plenty of time in rehearsals to work with actors and work with creatives and make sure that they feel safe they're not getting too like they're not ruining their mental state for the sake of a good show um lots of people unfortunately you know have done that it's quite easy to do if you get really invested in something that matters a lot to you which is why i think having these kind of mental health um approach to to sessions is really important so in the space we had a session where we basically did a read through of the script for the first time with all of us in the room our director, Shan, then talked about um, some stuff in the text. Maddie then talked about some of the inspiration behind the folklore elements um, and why we want to do a folk uh, horror show. And then I basically had a, a bit of a talk through the themes that are discussed and um, the, the sort of measures that I wanted to kind of put in place to make sure people were OK. So. Um, as the producer, one of the things that I um, have a role in is sort of welfare as well. So that doesn't mean people have to come to me and tell me everything. Um, it's completely if they feel comfortable. But um, we basically just, you know, let people know that if they do need to time out or just to like, just leave the room for a bit, it's fine. Just go and have five minutes. Just say, I need a bit of, I need to do this, whatever. Um, if people want to share their experiences, they can, but they're not forced to. It's completely up to people how much of, you know, potentially their own backstories they want to connect to whatever. They, they don't have to do that if that's not safe for them. Um, Theatre should be fun to do at the end of the day. Like whatever topics you're doing, it should be something you want to do and something that you're passionate about. You shouldn't have to be running yourself into the ground every time you do a certain scene. Uh, and there are different ways to do it. And it's something that we definitely, if we were able to get a lot more funding at some point, uh, or really any, <laughs> any particular amount of funding, um, we did get a little bit this year, which is exciting, but um, we would love to spend more focus sessions on accessibility, which includes things like mental health and making sure people are okay in rehearsal spaces, um, but also just working on our own kind of techniques in the rehearsal room um, to make sure we're doing check-ins and uh, that everyone has their own mechanisms that they need to use and that's okay. Just basically keeping open communication um, mm -hmm. with everything, making sure people are just aware, like communication is the absolute key with all of this. If you've let people know and you're genuinely open about wanting to be like it's genuinely fine just tell me or just do this thing or whatever or if you're not comfortable talk to us about it and maybe we can see if there's any changes we need to make that stuff's all really important you know um so that's you know some of the stuff that we try to do and it is complicated and we're not going to get it all right because we're still you know working on all mm -hmm. of it and it's all it, it's all a lot of stuff to be doing but we're trying very, very much uh, to put a focus on making sure that we're all okay uh, and just being open with each other. If it's like, sorry, guys, I feel awful today. Just putting it out there. If I'm snappy, I'm sorry. I'm not meaning to be always. Okay, now I know. 
I'll just be like, okay, I'll ignore her for a bit if she needs a bit of space, you know? I, I, I've always said that the most important thing is that you're trying, that you're that you're making an effort to put things in the right order, to make things go the correct way for your team, for your production. So why are these important considerations for a producer? Why is it important that a producer considers the mental health of their team, of their cast, of their crew? I think the second you don't do that, you shouldn't really be doing that role. <laughs> I think the second that you, when you start not really caring about how the team are doing and just kind of have, oh, just get on with it attitude, then that's not really the role for you. The producer is very, first and foremost, I sort of see it as it's a very people person kind of role you know and that doesn't always mean having to be bubbly and whatever but just being able to communicate with someone on, on a level and just you know being able to make sure that they feel comfortable enough to talk to, to, to you and if they don't feel comfortable enough to talk to me that they are aware of what other things they can do so one of the things that we did as well in the sessions is um, there's some resource lists um, that I am going to put together and send out to people as well um, Strut say phone number. I made sure everybody puts that in their phone because. Do you, do you know them, do you know the number? Not off by heart, but it's on my phone, and uh, I need so to you learn know, it. We'll make sure we link in the comments to this in the description. Strut yeah. say. Right. It sounds yeah. like a, a really a really valuable thing for for people to have, especially young people, to yeah. have saved in their phone. And what Definitely. a wonderful thing that they're that they're sponsoring your show. How, yeah, did, how, did, how did that come up? How did that come about? How did because it, that's quite quite a good thing to have that you're taking a show to Edinburgh and you've got a sponsor that's that's backing you. I think so. I'll just say first of all, they're more of like a charity partner rather than they're not giving us money or anything like that. They're just um, they're okay. our partner charity, um, um, which uh, is great. Um, it basically the way that they got involved is during the audition process, somebody um, got in touch who was auditioning, but also uh, they were involved in strut safe. And they basically just said about that because um, talking about street harassment is something in, in it, that we said in the audition notes um, that the show discusses street harassment. Um, and so they mentioned that and I basically heard of it through, I looked it up and then I realized I'd actually recognized it from the fringe last year um there's a company called f-bomb theater they run the femi fringe program now at edinburgh fringe um which is great we're in it uh and we we're, we're um we know them now they're they're great um but they basically were partnered with them last year and i got in touch with strut safe and was basically like we really like what you guys are doing I don't really know how we could help each other, but I'd like to talk about it maybe um, because we this is something completely new for us. We haven't had a sort of partner charity or something like that before, so it's really exciting. Um, and we had a conversation just basically about what is the show, what are the themes that it talks about, what are struts safe, what is their work, um, why why do they think it's important to have a phone line that runs. Currently, I think it's Friday, Saturday and Sunday. They want to make it for longer hours. They want to make it for more nights. But at the minute, due to funding and how much it costs, they can't. So um, we basically came up with the idea of, well, if, if you know, I, I, we'd like to be connected to you guys. So we are going to have um, donation buckets basically at our shows that people can choose to put in if they want. It's a paid show, um, so people will have already bought their tickets. Um, but a donation bucket that is specifically just for Strut Safe and also on pretty much all of our social media stuff that I can fit in the character count. I mentioned Strut Safe on there. Um, nice. They're mentioned on our poster. Um, they're in our um, on our website, uh, and it's basically just they c uh, shared a bit about the show and how we'll be supporting them. Um, and then we have been trying to give them a bit of a, uh, try to just men mention them to more people and make them a bit more aware because mm. like ultimately, you know, 
we're not particularly it's not particularly a financial thing that we get out of this it's more of a this is something that we care about it is just as important as the financial yeah contribution isn't it having exactly. a part having a connection with this with this charity with this organization is just as important that, yeah. that, that both of you are promoting each other yeah so hopefully hopefully it can and carry on to being something further path fringe we, we'll have to get fringe done first and see how that goes but they're a really great group we've um got to know a couple of their members a bit more now and hopefully we'll continue doing so but that's basically how we found out about them how they got involved uh and it's really honestly great of them to want to do this because obviously they are a charity there's like they can't be just like hey go and see this show but they can be like <laughs> bird watching are raising money for us and this is what it's about these are the topics you can if you can't see the show you can still donate to our phone line through this link but if you can or whatever and then we also share that people can donate just directly to strut safe as well if they're not a fringe because it's important and we we just think that's a really cool thing to be connected to and it's my thing that i'm most like excited about that i've managed to sort of help get put together why do you think that um, yeah. is? Why do you think that drives your excitement? I think because, well, one of the main things, the whole reason why we wanted to do Black Bright Theatre in the first place was A, we wanted, we wanted better, we wanted to see female roles on stage or female presenting roles or anything like that falls into those categories um, of women that were just women, like, you know, they didn't have to be this like, oh, like kick ass, like, yeah, or, or they didn't have to be just abused for no reason. And that's the storyline we wanted. Where are the just the actual people? Where are this, the, those kind of storyline driven narratives? Um, mm. Where's that? And that was the sort of initial thing. And then as we've kind of carried on, we've got a bit more kind of connected to the fact of you know there are topics that we really care about and but horror in general is a great genre for exploring things like you know um the treatment of women or street harassment or homophobia or how people are othered for whatever it might be um mm. and so we started to kind of think like you know well we have these lived experiences that a lot of people do and if they don't it it's something that people should be aware of and really trying to get people interested in the show who aren't just actually specifically people who've had these experiences as well but also like for example like men as well who might not have had the experience of potentially you know being followed home they might have but you know what i mean like in by um a, a man when you're like 13 and just sort of scared people who might not have had those experiences or don't realize how bad things like the issues of street harassment might still be um or you know think that things are potentially everything's fine it's all a bit better and you know we don't have to worry about them well actually these things do still happen and it's important mm -hmm. that we have these conversations open and going especially i mean the last few years has just been horrific for i mean we've heard so many things on the news um uh, you know like for example so like sarah everard and all of that um all of those cases and from those kind of really dark and upsetting topics and situations we think it's important to bring out you know how can we sort of raise awareness but in a way that is through the sort of creativity that we have and that we can utilize um, and at the same time be trying to, you know, pave the way for a genre that we care so much about and also helping give more representation on the stage. All of it is so important and building it together. We think that's really the ways that you can actually really make a difference by, you know, focusing on these issues that are really important but in ways that you can actively do. So, I mean, there's so, there's so many films or music that people have, you know, it inspires you, doesn't it? Or 
um, mm. that it might make you become a bit more aware of something or, you know, like help yourself deal with something going on in your own life. And, you know, it's all actively, it does make a change to people. And so we're basically trying to, well, we are doing this show with the purpose of raising awareness of the topics discussed and actively through having our collaboration with StrutSafe um, is great because we know we're directly, you know, trying to feed into that whole bigger picture of making streets safer, making people uh, be, be able to learn ways that they can help each other and themselves um just walking the streets you know things like that or accepting those othered elements of yourself so um maddie uh when writing bird watching a lot of her inspiration came from being a, a late diagnosed neurodivergent woman and also um a queer teenager and just kind of those experiences that you have and those sort of feelings of being so in and not able to be, you know, worried about being perceived and that kind of idea of always being watched and judged and not always having control is what bird watching is ultimately about. And those sort of kind of female fear, I guess. And um, that's something that we think is really important to keep highlighting and make people aware of and more so aware of ways that they can actually help you know we don't want to just be doom and gloom there is a place for doom and gloom um and you know the show does get a bit dark but at the same time we actively want to be trying to actually point people in directions of how they can help or take care of themselves or etc and a lot of that starts from i'm saying the trigger warnings right the way through to like talking to organizations like strut safe mm -hmm. to doing you know, things like this so it very very uh fun for you to have invited me along so thank you so much for giving That's me a chance great. to talk about all of this as well, well what so. you're doing is you're you're highlighting the importance of theater and storytelling the importance of what that does to the everyday person you don't yeah. have to be involved with theater to get something from it mm. it's the importance of what that gives to society to everyone that storytelling that knowledge that thinking from a from another perspective from another point of view mm -hmm. and how important that is for a male to see a show that's female led from your perspective to understand what females go through Tell me more about why that's important that that others should come and see a female led show. I think it's always good to be trying to see things from other perspectives, right? Like it you know, I might really enjoy watching something like Taskmaster, but if I only ever watch Taskmaster, then I'm not I'm not allowing myself to experience so many other things that are out there right so first of all it's a benefit to yourself as a consumer to be you know uh finding out about different perspectives different storylines things that you wouldn't have just come across in your everyday life perhaps um so first of all get some good entertainment mm -hmm. that's you know <laughs> and discover then, what you like and what you don't like yeah Exactly. Yeah. And honestly, seeing something you don't like is genuinely really helpful as well. <laughs> like, uh, be like, yeah. won't do that again. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Um, and then also, you know, because obviously female led kind of the whole forefront of what Black Bright was. But then also we, we do push now the fact that we are also neurodivergent led and queer led because there's these, these boxes of ourselves that we kind of are like, maybe we should include that. They're kind of also important. <laughs> we just kind of hadn't just ourselves kind of put in a box, I guess, and not really considered. But it's ways of learning about how other people can see see the world and, you know, and how people might feel about certain things, how they might have experienced life, how people from this background won't have any sort of understanding of something on this level of background, but they can potentially 
become aware and open to learning and you know learning how you can relate to people from different walks of life um it's also just important to support what we think support like you know female-led work queer-led work neurodivergent-led work um just international work i mean that doesn't count for us but you know like so many different um types of theater and performances and art that's out there why would you just want to close yourself off to one little box of it you know that there's so there's there's so much stuff that we know already that arts can do to make a change i mean an obvious (laughs) a bit of a weird example but the all the stuff with the postmasters that tv show absolutely none of that would was good it it pushed through like so many things that wouldn't have happened the most important piece of entertainment Mm -hmm. in years yeah it's almost um, it's almost unbelievable the effect that that show has had exactly because all going on for 20 years and the the governments the people in charge just kept pushing it aside and just kept pushing it under the carpet and it took that piece of entertainment for everyone to go what the hell is going on here exactly what, uh, yeah on? and now it's... things are being put right now hopefully hopefully, hopefully. yeah hope, um... we hope we hope the yeah. system is completely broke. <laughs> yeah, and, well, uh, people you know, can be more accountable, so can't they? And I think yeah. that's the thing as well, is like, like you said, you know, like things are getting put under the rug. And I think as well, something that a lot of, we're, we're a Northern based as well, we're a Sheffield based theatre company. And something that we sort of describe our work as is having the sort of Northern grit. And we think there's something really interesting about this whole, you know, typically like, British, Northern, get on with it. You, you've just got to get on with it because sometimes you just do. But the idea of actually there are certain things that, no, you don't have to just deal with happening. It's like, no, there are things that you can do. There are avenues that you can take. And often if you're if you don't have your own personal active stake in something, you can do wonders for people who do. Because it's not just, oh, there's the angry feminist person or like, oh, God, like another queer person shoving it down our throats or whatever. It's it's like, no, well, actually, these things can matter to just good people who want to make a difference and don't want there to be so much hate and fear and injustice in like out there, you know. Um, And that's why, you know, allyship is such an important thing as well. And why you know we say we're female led we're not female sort of exclusive you know like we we uh we want to have making these discussions wider and um getting more people involved with these topics I, that we care about the only way for people to learn is to embrace people is to share is to bring them in like you say you're female led you're not female exclusive yeah <laughs> <laughs> You're like, no, no men. Yeah. Stay out Get of out. it, man. Get out of it. <laughs> <You're horrible>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not that. It's like come in and see see the world through our eyes. Yeah. See what it looks like to us. See the struggles that, that we go through. And let's do that through a story. Yeah. An entertainment. And maybe you might take something from it and maybe you might not. Yeah. But let's yeah. let's give it a go together. Yeah, exactly. Um that is a big thing and especially what we're trying to do with with this show as well um and we're really excited to see how it goes we you know we were lucky enough to have had help from Sheffield Theatres where we're part of that development scheme just for having like free rehearsal space and that that sort of stuff which is incredible because rehearsal space is expensive um and then Strut Safe having that connection with them um, we also were lucky enough to be one of the, I think it's 180 companies who got the Keep It Fringe fund this year. Uh, it's not a massive amount of money. And they they say that they know it's not going to make or break a fringe. But it's the sort of thing that, you know, everybody should have the chance and the ability to try to do something like this creative. Um, if that if it's something they really care about and they think they can make a difference by doing so. 
Um, and so things like that that really address, you know, those kind of kind of inequalities as well in the creative arts world um, are amazing. So we've had a lot of help and support along the way and like we've still got a long way to go. We by no means are making money off this right now <laughs> at all. But that's no, not why we're doing that... it. I don't think that many people that go to the fringe have that idea. That's no, not well, this yeah. is about. This is um this is a, a launching a dream. This is the you know the the moving things forward path. It's not necessarily the the thing that's yeah. the end goal there. So yeah. to take me back to the start of the journey for this show then, because you've I've seen your crowdfunding. You're doing quite well on there. You've got few backers. You you set an initial goal mm -hmm. to to get you moving, which you which you're doing quite nicely with. But how did that How did that start? Where and you said you got some funding from somewhere else as well. How did that How did that start? And what advice have you got for anyone else that wants to come to the fringe? Um, I think so. I mean, all of this really started with the fact of crowdfunding is where just a lot of people have to start with basically like you know hello friends and family please help um basically uh mm -hmm. and like we're very lucky that we've had so many people who have been able to support us in that capacity but you know people can't we're, no one is in that financial position really anymore that you can keep doing that forever so you know we whilst we still we did we do have a crowdfunder and we do have we do accept donations and stuff if people want to support our work that would be great if anyone does by the way but um we um yeah, the link is all in the description below we'll make sure yeah, that's all there and pop them in <laughs> because um, unfortunately these dreams do need fuel and that fuel is finance yeah it's the biggest like oh it, honestly and it's the main reason why a lot of people i know maybe if they were doing stuff in theater or arts in general basically are like oh, I just can't I just can't afford it and the thing is it's like yeah there, there does have to be a realistic level of you know you've got to be able to afford your bills and whatever but at the same time I I think the thing that a lot of creative people have is that when they're doing their projects and that stuff that they really care about that is the thing that they enjoy over everything basically and it's something they can put their all in and they kind of almost have no choice but to put their all in as well because it's something you care about so much and the fact that these financial hurdles are so great and they are insane now as well with the fringe I mean there's there's so much stuff out there that people can look up with the the prices for like accommodation and it's it's crazy and scary and we're very we're still trying to figure out but bits of it but we know that we'll be able to get there at this point and then we'll figure it out but um yeah we we applied for keep it fringe fund we applied last year as well with um the hunger we didn't get it last year um there's obviously there's so many people that apply for it so mm -hmm. i think it's horrendously competitive and when we got it i was actually at work um work that pays me work not this work um <laughs> i was actually at work um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah the day job because um, i'm doing this all night so that's for sure so but um yeah. yeah like um we basically got an email through and me and maddie both have access to the blackbriar email so when these important emails come through you can just see instantly one of us is like maddie is typing or whatever it's just like <laughs> like have you seen this like have you opened it or whatever and i just normally we wait until we're both able to open it together but i just opened it because i was like I need to see it right now i'm stressed uh, and it said that we'd got it. And I literally, I called Maddie. I think I screamed in the office and people were like, it was the first time I'd been in this office. Like people had only met me on Zoom. And I was like, what the hell is going on? Uh, and then I, I went outside and called Maddie and she screamed as well. And we were just like, what the hell, what is going on? Because any kind of idea of getting any sort of funding, we are kind of almost given up on that being a thing. We've applied for Arts Council. It's so competitive. We've never managed to get it yet. Um, maybe one day um and a lot of these it's not actually very easy finding things to apply for for funding because a lot of them are very specific a lot of things you have to be a charity perhaps um or you know if you're like an independent theater company or something like that it's actually quite hard to get things that you're eligible for mm. it's actually really hard um and it's often 
these sort of smaller pots of things that pop up uh, that people put money into um, that that mean that you can apply. And so I'm just plugging my laptop. Um, so <laughs> just in case, um, yeah. So we we're really grateful to get the Keep It Fringe Fund. I actually don't know what we'd have done without it because they they basically. I think it's like 2,500, which doesn't even touch the sides, but my God, it's money I don't have to try and get from elsewhere. <laughs> so that is amazing. Uh, other than that, we have some relationships with some of the businesses in Sheffield. So there's a restaurant, BB's Italian, that we always go to for a sponsorship meal. Um, and we're doing that again this year. And they give us a few hundred, depends like what we sort of ask for, how many people we bring along. Because, you know, obviously pe places can't just be giving out money here and there. You've got to actually be able to give them something as well and that's just you know realistic um but so we've got that that will help us as well and then there's a couple of other things that i've applied for um that i'm waiting to hear back from can never be too hopeful with these things because honestly like the keep it fringe fund is the first thing that we've got and we've been doing stuff for like four years now so you know uh yeah it must be it actually, yeah, sorry, that's just crazy. I just had a realisation how long Black Riot's been a thing. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> just having a crisis. Having there. a moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, what uh, advice would you give to anyone that, that wants to come to the fringe and they know they need the finances, they know they need help with funding, and you say you've been, you've been at this for four years and this is your first pot of money that you've you've been able to get your hands on and like you say it's so difficult it is. Uh, i myself have done a lot of theater and have never been able to get my hands on any funding because mm. i don't i personally don't tick any boxes and most of the theater that i've done in the past hasn't ticked any boxes mm -hmm. um, yeah. and so it's it's very difficult if you've got a project that you want to get out there into the world yeah it's very difficult to get the funding so having been successful what is the main takeaway that you would say to people? I think that I think this with this project, we just we had such a clear idea of kind of what we were wanting to do with it with the whole strut safe thing and having that connection and that I think funders just like to see that you have plans for something and there's reasons why you want to do it rather than just it's so valid having something that you're like I just want to do it because it's fun and it's cool that should be a given but unfortunately that doesn't get you money or um and you know so and like you said unfortunately a lot of these things do become tick box exercises and obviously there's reasons for that and good reasons uh, we tick a lot of the boxes and even so it <laughs> like this is the first one we got I remember like last year we were applying for something and we were literally like okay what else what else can we fit into like just desperately because it can feel like that it can feel like you're just desperately shouting into the void like please i i deserve it <laughs> um but i think yeah just having like you know what why do you want to do this thing is there other stuff you want to do around the show is what is the reasoning what why what is the show what is the what is the idea behind why you think people should see it? Why do you think audiences would benefit from it? And, you know, not everything has to have a deep whatever matter behind it. There's, you know, plenty of comedy things or like clowning acts of circus things that get funded. And there's obviously reasons for all of that. And mm -hmm. often it's, you know, quality of how much you obviously care, the sort of potential something has is a big thing. Um, and I am literally by no means an expert. Otherwise I would have got funded a thousand times. But um, I think the thing of like you got to start from somewhere with it because uh, it is just kind of a ladder of trying to build on once you get funding once you're more likely to get it again but it's just that whole thing of like how do I get this job if I need work experience but I can't get a job that thing you know like yeah, yeah it's um, the whole chicken and the, chicken and the egg yeah one yeah what, what comes first and I think I think you've you've addressed a really important point there for for anyone looking to go to the fringe is address the reason why yeah that question why will lead to the to the answers for your funding will lead to why someone should give you money other mm. than this is just what I do and I'm good at it because yeah there's a lot of people that are good at this stuff yeah but but why why you yeah what what, what have you what are you going to be offering with the with the money to the it goes back a bit doesn't it to that that point of the storytelling and the social aspect 
Mm. What is yeah. the what is the impact of of what you're bringing to a festival? I think that's actually like a question that's on a lot of these forms. It's like, what impact can you da, 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 like? They like that word. It's, so. it's important, yeah. isn't it? Yes, I guess that goes to yeah the importance of of what you're trying to trying to do, and you clearly are trying to do something. And I'm very excited to to come up to Edinburgh myself. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and come and see this. And yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah, that would be great. So um, this has been a wonderful conversation. I've really enjoyed speaking to you, to you, Helen. Um, just as we wrap this up now, where you're going to be at the Edinburgh Fringe. Yeah. You're there <laughs> from the 2nd to the 24th, is that right? Yeah, we have two days off sort of in the middle of stuff. But Are you having a day off? Days. Is that allowed? Right, listen, honestly, last year we had one and we were like, what the hell this is we're dying but because you have a show every single day yes, but yeah. um and some people have more but this it wasn't even our choice we got told we have to have these two days off because we're swapping a venue and then okay. there's a day that the venue's closed so we were like wow we're basically <laughs> part-time this is amazing so <laughs> but yeah so i think we have like 21 sh shows roughly i don't know maths <laughs> two numbers can't do it but um, so where, where, do, where do people go to find out about your show then where do they go to where do they go to find you find the show buy tickets so we have a website and social media so we're black bright theater black the color and then bright like a light and our logo is a broken light bulb uh, all the publicity and uh, our logo is all done by our amazing like in-house artist slash very good friend uh, lucy by the way it's amazing graphic designer um, that we know from Sheffield uh, again um, and yeah so look for the the light bulb the cracked light bulb logo uh, we're on at the space venues so we start off at the space on the mile we have I think nine shows there then we move to the space at venue 45 all of this stuff is on the the space's website and the Edinburgh Fringe website as well um, but you can just go directly to our website or our socials and we have everything linked because it can be a bit, you know, we can't find a thousand things. But yeah, we're on, we're on at the space uh, and we're on their website or on the Fringe website. We have our own website and socials. You can find stuff on there. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. I've really yes, thank you. with you. And uh, like I said, I look forward to seeing you at the Edinburgh Fringe. Yeah, yeah. I look forward to seeing you as well. Can't wait. Thanks again, Helen. And if anyone was watching or listening, uh, we appreciate you for joining us for this conversation. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you.